Michael says, hi, Andrew. I have a design for a reciprocating saw blade without sending a prototype. How can I convince prospects that it works well? I have a prototype, but do I make one for all on my list? And should I include manufacturing method under the, okay, that's a, let's just hit the first part of your problem, your, your, your question, Michael, your problem, your question. Um, so, you know, what, what I, we always say at InventRight is you're not selling your, your prototype and you're not selling your patent, you're selling the benefit of your product. So Michael has a reciprocating saw blade and he, he wants to know how can I convey how well it works without sending a prototype? Well, you need to talk about that in your video or your sell sheet. So if it's a sell sheet, you need to talk about that. Let me adjust my camera here. There we go, okay. Um, if it's a sell sheet, you, you can talk about how it cuts twice as fast or you could show a picture of how it's very accurate and it gives a nice clean cut. These are all things you could relay in a sell sheet, eight and a half, piece, eight and a half by 11 piece of paper you're gonna send as a PDF. These are all things that you could relay about your reciprocating saw blade and how well it works. So, you know, what what would you do there to to does, to to relay that? I don't know how it's better, Michael. You have to explain that in your marketing. Gives a cleaner cut, cuts faster. There's nothing that you couldn't relay in a sell sheet about your blade. You don't have to have them use it. Now, if you felt like you did have to have them use it, there's nothing that couldn't be related in a video. So if you made a prototype, just one, and you got it to work, let's say nine times out of 10, it didn't work, but the one time it did work, it made this beautiful cut and fast, and you could show that on video. I mean, that's like an infomercial kind of deal, right? And so you can show that. And so the benefit of a video sell sheet is that it's going to, work right every time. When you send a prototype, they'll use it wrong, they'll break it, they'll go, oh, this thing didn't work, you know? And so if you're fairly certain, if you don't have any prototype now, not even one, but you're fairly certain your improvement would work, you could start pitching that, right? Now, I think the hardware companies, you know, it's a kitchen gadget or something else. They look at it and go, oh, I see how you put that slot on the spatula and or whatever it is and i could see how that would work it's easier to clean or what have you without seeing anything um but with the saw blade you kind of want to see the see the proof but you can get the interest first and here's the big misperception that if if there is if there's show interest in your product that if you don't have this perfect beautiful working prototype like the next day that they will oh well forget about it you don't have that you can't send it to me oh, they will wait. They, they have other things to do. If they needed to wait three months for you to get it to them, that'd be fine. But at least you've got the interest to go out and spend. Let's say you had to spend five grand making your, your reciprocating saw blade and making it work right every time like a production model. Well, what if nobody's interested? That's the kind of risky. Now, let's say you take a reciprocating saw blade and you modified an existing one. You modified it and it works but it kind of breaks after a while. Well, you could show that in a video and that would be fine. You know they can make it work, hopefully, but you can't make it work just like it works. So you're always selling the benefit of your product. Um, Madeline, can you uh, let me know? Is, are most people, looks like a lot of people are checking in. So I see you typing other things, just let me know. Looks like we got a lot of folks here. So thank you for the, for the switch. Um, the settings were wrong in the stream, so we need to create a new live stream. Um, so what you're selling is the benefit of your product, not your prototype. Um, and what do you, what Michael's asking, do I need to make 10 and send it to everybody? You know, a big thing that a lot of companies do, they're not companies do it, they're individuals, it's a marketing manager, and they email you back, send me your patent and send me a prototype. You should never, ever do that. 100% of the time, don't do it. 99% of the time, don't do it. Get on the phone and talk with them. They were intrigued by the benefit of your product. Anybody can take two seconds to write an email, send your prototype. And now you're jumping through your butt to get them a prototype when you could have verified that they're interested in the fact they take 10 minutes to talk to you on the phone. 
and they could talk about what they like about it. You get them kind of invested. Them sending you that email, send me a prototype, it's, it, it requires no effort on their part, none. It requires massive effort on your part. And it's usually not the right thing to do. Talk about the product, the benefits, how it fits in their product line. They realize you're a real person and they've invested themselves into the project a little bit. So no, I wouldn't go out and spend all that money, you know, doing, doing, uh, doing that. Um, let's see what else we got here. Can you talk, uh, Love says, can you talk a little bit about uh, the novelty gift industry, I'll be submitting a PPA. I'm not worried about them stealing my idea, but I am worried that they might not take it seriously without a PPA. The novelty gift industry, things go in, things come out very, very quick. Um, you know, uh, my business partner did a, did a, this isn't it, but this is just a pen, but it was a, a dart and it had a little suction cup on the on the end of it. And then it had, you know, little wings like a dart would. And it just, it was for Valentine's Day. And it said, I'm stuck on you. And he licensed that to a company that sold one season. And that was it. They wanted something new the next season. They didn't want to sell it. So running around filing patents on that is pretty stupid in most cases. Um, and so, but filing a PPA, it's 70 bucks. So love, if you want to do that, you can do it. Most of the novelty people, they don't care. The novelty whoopee cushion, I'm stuck on you darts, all sorts of things that, that are in novelties. Um, they don't usually care about patents. So, you know, and usually the novelty business, you need to show a lot more ideas before one hits. So let's say you show 10 ideas, even though a provisional is only 70 bucks, that would be $700. So if you really get into the novelty business and you get to know some of these companies, the way you get to know them is submit your first product and they know you from the other products, right? Um, they know you from the first product and they say, oh yeah, sure, send more. So technically I'm advising you officially to always file a provisional patent before you show anything to companies. But what I can tell you is if you're in the novelty business, you need to do a lot of products are you going to be filing a provisional every time? Now, Love said she wasn't concerned about it. She was concerned that they would take her seriously. In the gift and novelty industry, they will take you equally seriously without a provisional patent being filed. So they'll probably be kind of thinking secretly. They won't say to you, like, why did she bother filing a patent on this? Um, they might even be thinking, if they get a lot of ideas, is like, well, she's not a professional novelty designer because she filed a PPA or she filed a patent. Because when you file a provisional, you can say, you can just say patent pending. You don't have to say provisional patent pending. But officially, my advice for all products is to always file a PPA. That's my official advice. But I'll tell you a lot of, if you're just in the novelty business and you're doing, you know, 20 novelties a year, 50 novelties a year, do you want to file a PPA on everyone? Most professional novelty inventors don't. In other categories, you really do want to. Um, Let's see. Th thank you, Madeline, for Madeline said she was going to post on social media the new link for our stream since we had this little glitch. But it looks like we got plenty of people in here despite that. Um, let's see. Okay, so Matthew is saying regarding research, how much prior art research should I do? If you find something similar, does that mean you shouldn't pursue yours? So prior art is a is a patent kind of term that the patent office, patent attorneys use. And a lot of people misunderstood, misunderstand what prior art is. Prior art is anything that's been filed as a patent, but it's also anything that has ever been done and shown publicly in the entire world in the entire history of time. So it could be in some research paper in some library um, for some university. It could be shown on a website, it could be shown at a swap meet, it could be put up on a public YouTube video, any and everything that's ever been done is prior art. If something has been out there in the public for more than a year and nobody filed a patent on it, that is public domain. Anybody can do it, okay, providing somebody hasn't filed a patent on it. So, um, what, what Matthew is probably thinking and what most of you are thinking, oh, prior art means patents, but it means more than that. It means anything that's ever done and has ever been publicly disclosed. 
So it's not just patents. So the advice that we give all our students in InventRight is don't, the, the first thing you do, you never, ever, ever, first thing you do and come up with ideas, do a patent search. Complete and utter waste of time. I'm not saying you don't do it. I'm saying it's not the first thing. First thing you do is a Google image search. And people go, oh, I did a Google search, but Google searches won't, regular Google search, you can search for hours on there. And if you do the right Google image search with the right keywords for your product, you can find things within minutes. So as inventors, we're all really, really visual. You want to use Google images, not, um, not, not just doing a patent search. Now there's Google patents and then there's a patent office site, USPTO.gov. So my answer is to you, Matthew, you're asking how much searching should you do? And if you find something similar, should you pursue yours? So when I'm referring to prior art, I'm gonna be talking about doing a Google image search, searching on Amazon elsewhere. Google image is my favorite. There's other techniques too, and doing a patent search. Now, if you find something somewhat similar, it's a great thing. Did I shock you guys? It's a great thing because it shows there is a demand for that type of product. So if you have if you have a new barbecue spatula and you find eight barbecue spatulas that are kind of similar, but then you're like, oh, well, there's these eight. I didn't know those were there, but I've got this slight change. That is a great thing because companies can look at those eight that are already in the market and go, well, we know those are selling because they wouldn't be in the market if they weren't selling. There's eight companies selling that type of barbecue spatula. Oh, but you got this little tweak. So if you find things that are somewhat similar, quite often it, it, it validates your idea and it's a good thing. Now then people say, oh, but if I don't, Andrew, does that mean it's bad? No, no, it doesn't, it doesn't. I'm just saying it does validate if there is something similar. Um, now, when you get to the patent searching, people see an image on the patent search, they see a picture and they're like, oh, that's it, oh my God. But that's not important. It's kind of important. It does give you some clues, don't get me wrong, but you gotta read through the claims and go, what are they actually protecting? What am I doing that's different? And you have to read through the claims and understand. And I've said this before on these live streams, when you read through a claim, it's very confusing. So this is my best advice. It's kind of weird advice, but it's true. I've talked to patent attorneys about this. So like, that's good advice, Andrew. That's a good thing to do. So hopefully the claim is only two or three sentences and you'll read through it and you're like, I don't know what they just said. That's confusing. Re pretend like you have obsessive compulsive disorder. If you already do, you're set. And then read through it again and again and again. And I've done this before. And then I read through it like five times. I'm like, they're just protecting that hook with this claim. That's all they're protecting. That's not a problem with what I'm doing. I saw the picture freaking out with the picture on the pad. That's not a problem. Okay, next claim. Do the same thing. Read it like five, six, seven, eight times and go, oh, they're just protecting that hinge. Well, that's not a problem and analyze. But if you just read it once, you're like, huh? Because good patents shouldn't be written to be confusing, but some patent attorneys do that. A good strong patent, you should be able to understand, oh, that's what, and so some of them you'll be able to understand well, some of them you won't, so you'll need to read through it. So yeah, if you find the exact same thing is covering every feature of what you're doing, then you still shouldn't give up. You go, well, I've been thinking about this dog toy or this um, pancake pan or whatever it is. And uh, you can tell I'm getting kind of hungry. But <laughs> um, and and you go, OK, I'm upset. I'm going to I'm going to let this sit a little bit and I'm going to see if something comes to me. I'm going to come back, look at this, look at all the other products in that same micro category in that same space. And maybe a couple days or a week later, you're gonna come up with a new version of your product. You spent so much time thinking about this idea, do not instantly ditch it when you find the exact same thing. Um, and, but here's the, here's the other thing you need to take a look at. Is that product in the market or is it just patented? So if it's in the market, okay, you need to, uh, look at it from a different angle. Now, just because in the market doesn't mean it's patented. People bring stuff to market all the time, it's not patented. So then you look up to see if it has a patent, and, and if it doesn't, you can do that exact same thing, but you're not gonna wanna license the exact same thing that's out there to a manufacturer, because they will find that. You gotta come up with some improvement. But if it's not patented and it's in the market, and you come up with improvement, go ahead, 
emphasize all those same features and emphasize your improvement to it as well. And then you can file a patent on that improvement because if there's no other patents, you can file it on that improvement. Now, if that product's been out there more than a year, you, you, can't, you can't get protection on that product that's been out there more than a year that hasn't been patented by anybody, but you can on that one piece that is different. So there's so many angles. We could, I could go endlessly into variants of this and some inventors like to get into that. It, now, who is asking this? Uh, Matthew asked this question. It was a hypothetical question. I don't find it to be an issue the vast majority of the time with our students. People think it's always gonna be an issue. I have never in 20 years had one of our students say that they licensed something and then they to a company and then the, somebody else said you were infringing and they got sued. People worry about that all the time. It could happen. I've never had that happen in 20 years. Um, now, companies, when you sign a licensing contract, it'll quite often the contract will stipulate that you're saying that you don't, you're not aware of any other prior art and that you're responsible if there is. And that freaks inventors out. But in 20 years, I've never had it come up with our students. And we've had students in over 65 countries. So it could, but it's it's very rare. I think it, it's very helpful. I've, I've had people um, say, Andrew, it's very helpful when you say what is common and what's not. I can answer this question. I could say that's extremely uncommon, but it could happen. So it kind of gives you perspective on what to worry about. Like, oh, that's a common thing. You should know how to handle that. That's not uncommon. Okay, know how to handle it, but no, it's not going to come up every two minutes. It's, it's extremely rare. Uh, so this one is, that's an interesting handle, 5 Bro Corp. Okay, 5 Bro Corp. Um, I know it's YouTube, so I know you guys aren't doing that on purpose, but it's funny. I like calling people by their name. Uh, regarding provisional patents, does it have to be written in attorney language? And if not, how can you defend it for priority? So um, no, uh, a provisional patent has absolutely no formal requirements. You can write it, you can write it in common English. And you know, the provisional patent is not a patent, guys. It's a placeholder. You later have to file a full utility patent and reference the provisional. Again. In 20 years with students in over 65 countries, I've never had an inventor where they needed to protect their intellectual property and that one year from the provisional patent till the time they filed was an issue and they needed to reference or the attorney needed to reference the provisional with something that was covered in there because that one year was an issue. Never in 20 years have we seen that. It could happen, So, but I'll still answer your question. So just wanna give you guys a point of reference on uh, what's common and what's not. Um, so what's really cool about uh, Fibro Corp, what's really cool about um, the provisional is you could not have covered it in detail in writing, but have had a picture that had that feature. And you could actually say, look, I didn't cover it, but I did cover it with that picture. Or I did cover it in writing, but I didn't cover it with the picture. So you want, um, having a lot of pictures we talk to our students about is very beneficial. Now people go overboard, but having some pictures with different angles, it could be a black and white picture that you took. It could be a color picture. Um, it's good to get some line drawings done. They don't have to be official patent drawings because, again, there's no formal requirements for provisionals, but they could be line drawings that were done. Um, and so, yes, you can do that. And they have to make the argument then, too. But it's so rare that that's an issue. And your attorney will cover things very thoroughly. It's a good attorney, uh, patent attorney, in the full utility patent. But I've, I've, I have personally never talked to an inventor where the one year the provisional, they ever even had to go to the provisional. They never did see what was referenced in there. Um, never, never seen it. Could happen though. Um, okay, or, the original bar back, that's the person's name or their handle. Hi Andrew, once I put my list of companies together, should I make a customized sell sheet for each company I send to them? For example, each company's um, Legos, font, colors, and marketing materials. Wow, that would be pretty hard to do, wouldn't it? Well, I, instead, what you want to do is you could do that. 
but you know, we always teach our students, don't make some anemic list of companies, have 20 or 30, not two or three. Okay, because then you have 20 or 30 chances for success. If you only have one company that you could license to, it's usually because you don't know how to make your list of companies and you're not being thorough enough, not because there is only one company. And if there is only one company, you seriously should question whether or not you should be working on that project. Because you, you do all this, you file a patent, you file a provisional, do a sell sheet, and you're going to show it to one company of one chance for success as opposed to contacting 25 and have 25 chances for success. You have to think about as an inventor, does that make sense? And it doesn't in most cases. You could, but getting back to your question, should I make a sell sheet for everyone? Like if it's for Legos, like make it their colors. For the most part, what most of our students will do is, if it's for Legos, it's a toy. So a toy sell sheet will have a certain feel. You don't make it look like a medical product, like me medical products are like blue and white, right? It has this really kind of clean, um, sterile look. You don't want to do that for a toy. So for the most part, if you make, I keep wanting to call, by, call you by your name, but I'm not going to keep saying the original barback, but for the Original barback. So for for uh, the most part, you're you're being um, industry or category specific to that type of industry or category. You're not making a different sell sheet for everyone. We've talked about that, how you can do it, but that would be ridiculous to make 25 different sell sheets. Would it grab their attention? Yeah, it probably would, but it's a little impractical. But it's a good question. Um, Jay Bab. Um, one of my projects has been rejected by everyone I've contacted because in nearly every case, it will complete, compete with their current products. And uh, she wrote, or he wrote, I don't know, time to venture. I don't know what that means. Um, oh, time to venture, question mark. Should I venture it? So let's let's address that. Um, let's address the, t is, it, is it time to sell it myself? Let's address that, and then I'll address your other question. Uh, for most of you know, you got to decide what your business model is. Could you do both? Yeah, you could. But some people are so attached to their project that they're willing to like, you know, licensing it. It's their money. It's their workforce. And it's their existing distribution. You don't need to start a company. You license it to them. They take care of all of that. Now, some inventors are so stubborn. They're like, well, oh, I, I contacted all these companies. Now, JBab, maybe your sell sheet sucks. Your marketing materials suck. Maybe your list of companies is three companies. You might be doing other things wrong with regards to licensing that you need to take a look at and reach back out to those companies. So it's been, you say it's been rejected by everyone. I don't know what you mean by everyone. I don't know if that's two companies or 25, and I don't know if your marketing materials are good. So there would be some things to look at. Did I go to enough companies? Did I go to the right companies? And did I submit the right marketing materials? So that would be one to look at. But um, you know, now are you going to, because you got rejected, are you going to now start a business? You're going to quit your job. You're going to dump your other business. You're going to mortgage your house and home to start your own company and venture it. Um, you know, Steven, our other co-founder, he's done nothing but license his entire life. But he did these little guitar picks. I've told this story before. And he was able to make those for six cents a piece. They sold in a, a three pack for two ninety nine. And he started that business with a couple of his friends with $200,000 on a six cent product. I guess if you add it up, it's an 18 cent product. It wasn't enough money. So just imagine if your product is $29.95, what kind of money you need to venture it. Now you could do some rinky dink, you know, well, I'll just sell it on my own website and I'll, you know, I'll try to get on Amazon and, and, or I'll advertise it on Facebook. But that's not what most of you envision for your product. Most of you envision going really big. When you license to a really big company, you can have delusions of grandeur and you are not delusional. That you, It depends on the product. They could sell 10,000, 20,000, half a million units. Depends on the product because they're big and they can do that. Also, when you venture a product, you're not going to survive with one product ever. You're going to work your butt off to get into retailers. They're not going to want to take you on because you're a one product company. They're worried you're not going to deliver on time. You're going to run out of cash. You have all these issues. They've learned that it's happened to them before. And they don't want to deal with you. But let's say you fight tooth and nail. I respect people that do that. And you get into a few retailers. If you don't get other products to them, they're going to kick you to the curb. 
or what's going to happen is other vendors that have 15 products or 20 products with that retailer is going to kick you to the curb because that vendor is more important to the retailer than you are. You know, so should you venture just because everybody said no? Now, another option is to, well, reach back out. I have students do this all the time. They'll reach back out six months later and they'll, they'll, work send it to all the same companies few new ones and they'll license it so people are like what are you talking about andrew they all said no well they're all just individuals they're marketing managers they said no the company didn't say no the individual said no and they were just really busy they were doing a lot of different stuff you know and so now you said six months later and two weeks earlier you hit them just at the right time it's timing basically and they, their boss said, we need new products, and now they're interested. Holy crap. So you can do that. Um, my headset is beeping because I was in an hour-long webinar just before this. I want to see if it's a possibility that I can change my, my audio input because if I can't, it's going to eventually go dead. Um, let me see if I can do that. I don't think once I start a live stream, I can change. Let me see if I can change no, can't change my mic. I don't think I can change anything here. Um, let's see. Yeah, I, you know, when my headset starts beeping like that, I can hear it. You guys can't hear it. It can go pretty long before it dies. So I think we'll be fine. Um, okay. So let's see. If not, you know, if, if my headset dies, we're going to call it a night, guys. I'm just giving you a heads up. Uh, all sorts of fun technical problems tonight, huh? Um, Devin says, are submission forms valid for contacting companies? Forums, submission forums. I don't know what you about need, mean by a submission forum. Um, if it's a submission form on their website, yes, it's valid. I think it's perfectly acceptable to go around those forms and contact a marketing manager as well and ask them. And if they say, no, nope, got to go through the form, well, then follow the rules. But if you can get to a marketing manager as opposed to going through the form on their website, that's great. Um, definitely, especially if they just haven't responded in a while. So I say do both. Why not? You have nothing to lose. Uh, Ernest said, can I sell an idea if I don't have the means to patent it? Well, Ernest, the question is, a lot of people think you're, you might be new. You can file a provisional patent application for $70. So you might have 10 grand to get a patent, but if you can afford $70, you can legally say patent pending with a provisional patent. Um, we have some software on our site called Smart IP that will help you write your own provisional patent, and then you pay the patent off as 70 bucks. You can go to InventRight and check that out. Um, so if you don't have the means to patent it, that means you don't have 70 bucks. If you don't have 70 bucks, you need to focus on earning more money through your business or through freelancing or through getting a better job, because if you don't have 70 bucks, that's a problem. Um, so, uh, you know, but maybe you weren't aware of the provisional patent application and now you are. Um, uh, Molinar, I have a product which I have not seen on the market. My question is, how do I know when to stop designing? I keep making tweaks and changes. Huh, that's a good, that's a good point. Um, you know, it's hard to say. Uh, I think that at some point, you know, people will keep designing and keep messing with their prototype or in their head or the design in order to avoid reaching out to companies because they're afraid of it or don't know how to do it. So if you believe, Molinar, that your version is good enough, that the benefits are clear and you can relay it in a sell sheet or a video, you're, it's not about that prototype. It's about relaying the benefits. So if you believe it has benef clear benefits, just pitch it. Stop messing with it. You know, they're more than likely they're going to make some tweaks, and that's okay. So uh, I say more than likely you can stop designing. It sounds like you're kind of saying, I keep messing with it, 
I think it's good. That's that's what I'm reading between the lines. I think it's good, but I keep messing with it. I keep improving it. Now, avoid throwing everything in the kitchen sink in there. That's a big problem. You know, uh, you figure out what the core benefits are. Don't if you keep messing with means I keep tacking on features. So you know, so now it's the Swiss Army knife. That's usually not a good idea. Um, so focus on the core benefits. Um, Let's see. Robin's asking a question, and Robin typed in all capitals. Don't type in all capitals, but it got my attention, so I guess it worked. Um, <laughs> have I, I, I have an invention for brooms and mops. Any companies right offhand would be interested that I could consider to contact. Thank you. You don't need me to tell you, Robin. Why, why are you asking me? It's pretty clear. I mean, if a company's making brooms and mops, contact those companies. And even better, only contact the ones that are in the stores where you want to be. And you could contact people making maybe slightly related things to brooms and mops. So that's your list. It's that simple. People think it's so complicated. It's not. Um, you don't need a validation that they're open and they're gonna op they're gonna they're gonna welcome oh, we welcome all inventors. No, you don't you don't need that. If they're in a major retailer you want to be, you should reach out to them with your sell sheet or your video. Not saying I have an idea for you. Say, can I send that to you? Would you be the right person to send it to? I got a lot of great questions here. Hopefully my headset doesn't die. Um, let's see. Get some new folks in here. Uh, Septar, I got it. Septarshi, Septarshi. Uh, suppose I approach a company with my product idea, which is at a very crude stage and needs modifications, um, or and purification, purification. Okay. Uh, how do I con convince myself and the company that the idea is really mine? Um, because you're not selling your prototype. If you can illustrate to them with a virtual prototype quite often um, the, what the product would look like, that's enough. Get their interest. Go fishing. Why would you Why would you think that the product isn't yours because you can't make a perfect prototype? Um, you, you don't want to be rambling about the benefit of the product. You don't want to show something so crude that it's, it put, is off-putting. But um, you can get a virtual prototype done or get some sort of drawing done or Photoshop work done, and you could relay what the product would look like. And if you're fairly sure that they can do it, who said you have to be able to do it? I, I know I'm like a broken record. I say that all the time, but this really helps a lot of people saying that. So that's my answer. Um, uh, let's see. So uh, June... Junia, Junaid, can we work with an event right to sell our ideas to companies? Yeah, you can, but we're going to make you do the work. So Steve and I, we've been coaching and mentoring inventors for the last 20 years. And, and tip, you know, we, we get inventors licensing products every week, but we're guiding you to do the work. So, you know, we're, if you're looking for a company to do the work for you, you're going to find an endless list of shysters, these invention promotion companies that will tell you they're going to do the work. And I've never, I can just speak from personal experience. I'm not going to talk about any company in particular. I never do because um, I can't say libelous things about other companies, nor would I ever do that. But I have never met an inventor in 20 years that had a company that said, we'll license your idea for you, which is the, what we call in the patent office, Federal Trade Commission calls them invention promotion companies. Never in 20 years have I met a single inventor that has ever had a product license that way. They may exist, I've never met one. But I talk to, we talk to inventors every single day that's been taken, typically it's around $10,000. They take $10,000. So if you wanna do this, you have to do it yourself. But we guide and we'll mentor you through it all, including through the negotiations, how to reply to an email, what's say the next phone call, helping you with the sell sheet, helping you with list of company, helping you with absolutely everything. But if you think you can have an idea and not do any work, 
licensing is a thousand of the work of starting a business, but it's still work, guys. You still got to do the work to pitch it to those, you know, 25, 30 companies. It's not scary, but I'm not going to tell you it's not any work. It is work, but don't look for somebody to do it all for you. You're just going to find an endless list of shysters. Um, uh, uh, Car car noises. That's an interesting handle. I'm having fun with these handles. Is a patent agent different than an attorney? Yes. A patent attorney and a patent agent are different. Um, they can both file patents equally fine, but a patent attorney can go to court. Now, very few patent attorneys ever go to court, but a patent attorney can go to court and a patent agent cannot. So a patent agent, but they can both file patents. People would tell you that agents are sometimes less expensive, um, and some people would say, oh, they're not as good as an attorney. I disagree. Um, I think that they can be just as good. I've met some pat I've known patent attorneys or seen work from patent attorneys that are, do terrible work. Um, so I don't think that an attorney is better than an agent or an agent's better than an attorney. Um, sometimes the agents can be less expensive. They had less they they didn't they went through the training to be a patent agent, but they are not an attorney. I think I'm about 99% sure patent attorneys can file trademarks and patent agents cannot. They can just file patents. But if a patent agent cannot go to court for you, you don't want to go to court anyway. And very few attorneys go to court. Um, they usually specialize that in, if they do and they're litigators, but a patent agent could never do that. So that's the difference. This is a great question. I'm glad we have so many questions. I, I, it looks like everybody was able to jump on the new stream, or at least most of you were. Um, uh, do you, you do too much is the handle. I like that. That's the handle of the person asked the question. Do you know of any companies in the first responder market that accept outside submissions? Again, I don't need to tell you you don't need verification that they take outside submission, guys. Don't look for it. You're wasting your freaking time. That's that's being timid and being afraid. If they're in the first responder market, you approach them. You send them a sell sheet. They'll let you know if they're not open. You don't need verification if they're open or not. Don't look for it. You'll find out. They'll tell you. They, but they, they're not going to say, hey, buddy, take a hike. Why do you think you could send me an idea? They never say that. They don't. Don't worry about it. It's not a problem. And don't be so timid that you just don't approach them all. Do it. Um, uh, Jugoslav. Um, my invention is in the solar industry where the piece costs about 100 to $300. What percentage is appropriate here? So again, with royalties for consumer products, the most common royalty is 5%. It could go up to 20%, or if you license something to Coca-Cola and they sell a billion Cokes a day, it's going to go on every Coca-Cola bottle. Maybe 0.00001% would be great. But a common royalty rate is 5%. But again, it's not about the royalty rate, guys. I talk about this every time, but it's, it's good to know. It's the royalty rate, the price of the product, and the volume they could be sold. So, you know, Jugoslav, if you get a 15% royalty, and the company is only going to sell 100 units a year, well, you're not going to be very happy with those royalty checks. So again, there's three components, the royalty rate, the price of the product, and the volume they could sell. And the volume they could sell is through an interview. And if they can't sell enough, you thought they were this big company, but you're like, they're like, well, that's all you can do? Then you don't do a deal with them. It's that simple. So that's a, that's a, I, I love getting that question. Um, Uh, Cindy says, I have not really found any little companies to submit my product to. Have a suggestion? Question mark. Well, Cindy, why do you need little companies? I don't know why you need little companies. Um, some of them might be small, medium size. I, I put four categories. You don't have to write this down because it's just silliness. But I would say small, very small company, um, medium size, large company, and then mega corporation. What's a mega corporation? A Google a 3M, a Procter & Gamble. Um, I like the big companies that aren't, I define them as mega corporations. Um, I mean, sorry, not mega corporations like Google or Apple. Most companies are really big. For example, in a consumer product, they might have distribution in Target and Walmart and Rite Aid, but they're not a 3M. 
you know, or a Procter and Gamble. So if they have distributions in those big places, they're definitely a large company. Um, well, not definitely, but more than likely. I don't overanalyze how big or small they are. If you can do it, if you if you approach 30 companies and only a, a slightly smaller company is interested, doing a small deal is better than no deal at all. If you want to hold out and reapproach them all six months later because you're like, nah, it's too small of a deal for me, do that. Don't give up on your idea. And if you've only privately showed it for licensing, you publicly disclosed it, you can file a provisional again and get another year. It doesn't extend your original provisional, but you can file a provisional again and get another year. Um, uh, Alexander says, any, does any of your students have success in the medical industry? I haven't heard much about that market. Medical is, is tougher. There's different kinds of medical. There's the gadgets and the gizmos that you see in senior catalogs. There's a, our, the country, the US is getting older and older. Um, and so that's a huge market. You get these catalogs, like a, a stick that helps you reach a, um, a can on the top shelf. And it's like a little grabby thing and it's a stick and it has a grabber on the end of it. That's not a medical product, but devices for seniors and assisted living, that's a category. And then there's like things like band-aids and gauze, and then there's surgical instruments and stuff like that in the medical device category. He, he wrote medical industry. In the medical device category, they are more obsessed about patents than other categories. If it's a thing for reaching a can on the top shelf for a senior, they're, they're not obsessed. They usually like it, but they're not obsessed. The medical device people are really patent obsessed. Um, and then, you know, if it's in disposables, they, they like pat to see patents as well. So um, they're harder industries to license to. I wouldn't say really hard, but they're harder than a consumer product category, and they care more about patents, um, definitely. So that's what I would say, Alexander, but you could definitely license in that industry without a doubt. Um, hey, Andrew, um, early, in early communications, the large company that operates in the US, the, in the UK, et cetera, I only have a US PPA and the UK headquarters wants to see my idea. What are your thoughts? Is it safe? Well, the UK is a PCT country, a patent cooperation treaty country. So in a roundabout way, a patent attorney wouldn't represent it this way, but as, as not being a patent attorney, I am going to. In a roundabout way, a US provisional patent is, is letting you later file what's called a PCT. So a PCT will extend your provisional. It's the only way you can extend the provisional. It gives you, it doesn't, extend your provisional. It gives you 18 months after your provisional to file in countries around the world. And so, you know, but you probably wouldn't need Christian to do that. So you have a lot of leverage. So if they're interested, you can show it to the UK guys. But if the US people are interested, the US division is interested, you they can say, oh, we don't want to pay you in the UK because you don't have any patents there. Well, first off, you do. You've preserved the right by filing a US provisional to file a PCT and later file in the UK. So I wouldn't worry about it. And also, but let's say they don't even want to file patents in the UK. You can say, well, I want you to pay me royalties in, in the UK even if you're not filing patents in order to get the US right. So you have leverage there, okay? Um, and we've helped many of our students do that. Uh, uh, Damali says, uh, hey, Andrew, would you send a sell sheet to a toy company with a showroom in Hong Kong? Well, I don't care where they have a showroom in Hong Kong. I care less about that. But I see, your, I kind of see your point. I mean, if they're a U.S. company, I wouldn't hesitate to do that. I mean, all these companies are getting stuff manufactured in China. So to say, I don't want to deal with any company that doesn't get anything manufactured in Asia at this point is a little unrealistic. You're welcome to do that. But um, if you filed intellectual property, you're protected in whatever country that you're in. Um, and so what if they have a showroom in Hong Kong? It doesn't mean they're going to put your product in it, your your prototype. So I, I wouldn't be worried about that. I need more information, of course, but I wouldn't be worried about that. Um, uh, hey, Andrew, is it okay to pitch your idea with a group instead of yourself? I don't know what that means. You know, when you pitch, I, I don't know if you have a group of people, but, you know, you don't pitch. Your sell sheet or your video does the pitch. So when you contact the company, you're sending your sell sheet or your video. You're not pitching on the phone. You're not flying out, meeting within the corporate boardroom. Complete and utter waste of time. Don't, don't do that, guys. You're just 
going to waste your time. So if you if you eventually later they show interest and you get based on your sell sheet or video and you get on a conference call and you have a group on or it's a group video chat, you can have a group on. That's fine to show you have a team behind you. Um, what do we run? We ran up on the hour, but I want to give you guys some extra time because, uh, well, we were supposed to start at 510, but because we have that technical glitch, we're supposed to go to 610. So we actually do have some extra time here. My, just to let you know, my headset's been beeping at me for the last 25 minutes. So if it just dies, we'll just call it a night. Um, so we'll make sure not to set up the live stream next time to be for software because that's what it was set up for. So that's why we need to jump on this other stream. And um, God, I, I had my headset all charged up, but I did a whole another hour long webinar before I did this one. And apparently my headset battery was uh, couldn't handle that. Um, let's see what else we got here. Okay, Raul, how important is is choosing a personal company name when presenting yourself to a potential licensee. Not important at all. It's not important. Um, one of the tips, so, so our students don't, because you can just obsess about that. One of the tips we give our students is just put your name and designs behind it. So in your email signature, like for me, it could be Andrew Krauss, uh, product developer, Andrew Krauss Designs. Make your email Andrew Krauss Designs at Gmail. Don't need a website. And that's it. You're done. That's your professional appearance package. You know, if you go to a, a trade show, you're going to want a, a, a business card. You know, it doesn't really matter that you show you theirs. You show them yours. You, should, you need something to give because you don't ever expect them to call you, but you get their card. That's key. But um, so the company name is not important. It really isn't. Product name is important. The benefits are important. The presentation is important. They do not care. They don't care if you've licensed. You don't need a website that shows you, oh, I license all these products. They don't care. They just care about what you're showing them right now. There's no difference between you and our other co-founder, Stephen Key. They don't care. Now, when you build up a relationship with companies because you send them an idea and they aren't interested in that, you ask them for more, building up that relationship, that's important. But they don't care what your company name is. They really don't. Um, People obsess too much over that. And if you use your, in every state that I know of in the US, US, if you use your full surname, so like that's your first and your last name, put designs behind it, you don't need to file a fictitious business name statement. Don't quote me on that. Look up in your local area. I don't think anybody would ever call you on that. You're not actually selling product to the public. You're just trying to pitch a business deal. So I don't think anybody would ever be upset about that. It's just one less thing to do to have to file an LLC or something. Again, you know, contact your, your, your tax attorney or your legal advisor if you're worried about that sort of thing. Um, da -da -da. Um, our dit wrote, what if I get a PPA in the US, but then I sell my idea to a German company? Does that mean my idea is protected there? Um, no, you would need to then file a PCT and then file a, a patent in that country. But Germany is a PCT country, so you would have the right to file a PCT and then a patent in Germany. I, I'll tell you guys, our students have licensed products around the world, um, but the, the most of our students are doing deals in the US and in Canada. And we do deals all the time in Europe, but it's not as common. Um, U.S. companies are a little bit more open, and we have European students. We go, don't limit yourself to Europe. Yeah, this way, I always joke about it. As Americans, we buy way too much stuff. We just buy, 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 and then we work our butts off to pay for it. And you as inventors, that's great for you because there's tons of companies selling tons of stuff to Americans and Canadians. Europeans tend to be more careful with their purchases. They won't buy three, four cars for the family. They'll buy one really nice diesel Mercedes or something, and they'll have it forever. And I find that to be fairly true with other purchases as well. Um, you can definitely license to European companies, but, um, but there are a little... It's a little less likely to happen. I'll say it. I, I've just I've seen it over 20 years. I would 
definitely approach European companies as well, but it's less likely you're going to license to a German company than, uh, than a U.S. company. This U.S. company is going to be way more likely. Um, let's see what else we got here. Wow, I got so many questions, huh, Madeline? So many. I want to thank Madeline for, for helping out um, with these. I want to thank her so much. I'm, I'm asking her to always find, because she's been with us since, what is it, the seventh one we've been doing, to find new questions that are a little bit different. So she's kind of picking some questions that we kind of haven't answered in the last six sessions we've done and putting them into Skype for me. And I'm reading some of those. I'm just randomly getting some from the, the chat um, as well. But I want to thank Madeline. And thank you, Madeline, for getting on social media and letting everybody know that we had to jump to a new stream. Um, so I just wanted to thank you for what you do. Um, let's see. Uh, Don, spelled D-A-H-N. Hey, Andrew, I'm starting the boot camp in June. Oh, that's great, Don. That's great. So you, you guys can check out our programs if you go to an event right and go to services. Our boot camp is our flagship program and the main reason why we have students licensing every week. Um, Stephen and I, I don't mean to brag, but we're very proud that our students are licensing products. You don't see invention promotion companies licensing products for inventors. You just don't see it. But our students are licensing stuff all the time. But it's not just about licensing that first product with us. It's about becoming empowered with real life experience. You've gone through the whole process and now you can do this the rest of your life. As I said, I think on the last session, it's either inventing is part of who you are or it's becoming part of who you are. It just happened to you one day. And for most of you, you're never going to stop coming up with ideas, but it starts to become a little bit of thorn in your foot when you keep coming up with ideas and you're not doing anything with them. You know, it's really... It's really, really tough. Um, uh, well, some you got my attention, underdog. You wrote in all capitals and put a bunch of cow emoticons. How can I ignore that? Please, everybody, don't do that. But I will answer your question, underdog. I have a trademark that's pending approval through the USPTO. Will a clothing company license my trademark? Absolutely, that's possible. I mean, there's a difference between a t-shirt company and a clothing company. Um, it's a possibility. There's a lot of stuff to go into there, underdog, as far as, you know, what are you trying to license? Is it is it like a fun graphic? You said a trademark. Um, can you license copyrights and trademarks? Absolutely. One of our students, her name is June, and she's licensed like 60 um, to – products like it's, it's she's not licensing products she's licensing her artwork to go on products and she's done like 60 licensing deals some of those deals were like the same company for like 10 different products or 10 different SKUs, stock keeping units so um it sounds a little bit bigger than it is but it, that is possible um absolutely um uh, matt miller said well Sorry, I said the name. <laughs> Will companies do business with you if you have a criminal record? I, you know, I've never had that question before. I thought, Madeline, I would thought like I've heard it all in 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 20 years. I've never heard that question. In the, we, I don't get it so much anymore these days. But in the in the old days, we used to get letters from people in prison, like handwritten letters. And I haven't seen one of those in a long time. I don't know if they're going to our PO box, and I'm just not getting them anymore. But we used to get them all the time. Um, I don't think they'll look into it and I don't think they'll care. And, and if you know somebody or if you had a criminal record and you're inventing and licensing products, well, good for you that, you know, you turn things around, you know, or maybe you just had some bad luck or whatever. You did something wrong, but you're doing good now. Um, I, I don't think most of them would care or look into it. They just want your idea. They're not buying you. They're buying your idea, but they are buying you in that you need to be easy enough to work with. Um, so I don't think they'll do a background check. I wouldn't worry about that. Um, that was an interesting question. Um, uh, Julio says, can you say or write some of the things that the book Become a Professional Inventor contains? Um, 